Hi! In this process video, I'll share how I got from this doodle to this animated 3D model. Originally, I made this doodle to promote commissioned portraits in my personal style. Portraits like this, and this, and this. <coughs> Shameless self-promotion. Insert your portrait here. Moving on to modeling the character. The head is a subdivided cube. The nose, a subdivided cube, extruded. The eyes, concentric spheres, and the eyebrow, squiggles, and hair are curves converted to mesh. The curves needed to be transformed into mesh to animate with the wiggle bone add-on. This took some trial and error and weight painting, as a wiggle, wiggle bone can be a bit chaotic to wrangle, but provides a base animation fast. I love all the NPR art the Blender community puts out, especially stuff like this. I just find it really pretty. Check out some of James Shedden's stuff for inspiration. He's got loads of artwork online. James uses a program called Absynth to stylize his renders. I thought I'd give it a try. Absynth works by dicing the input keyframe into many small pieces, which it reassembles and applies. This is different than what AI or popular style GANs do, as style GANs actually generate new data based on learning and inputs. Up next, I'll share a handful of Epson tests. Here's a video version of the image sequence that I stylized. This is the result of two stylized keyframe inputs that were hand painted in Procreate. This is the result of one keyframe that was stylized with render passes in Photopea. Let me explain. When rendering out the original video, I saved several render passes, such as the Crypto Material Pass, Direct Diffuse and Shadow Pass, and Mask Pass. I then brought the passes into Photopea and stylized them by combining different filters. In the first hand-painted keyframe test, the results were melty because the keyframe details deviated too much from one another, thanks to my painting ability. Stylizing with passes allows for more accurate stylization. Here, Epsynth uses only one keyframe, but the stylization is more accurate, so the result is still comparable to that first test. The more keyframes inputted, the better the result. Stylizing frames that showcase the animation range helps. Color blocking the render to match the stylization also helps. This is the peak of my tests. Not bad, but not exactly what I envisioned. It was time to make use of Procreate's new texture painting update. Last year, Procreate made the leap into 3D and now has 3D painting support. This is a default model that comes with the update. I texture painted the canvas of the skate. The truck materials are already baked. Toggling the base layers, we can see Procreate currently supports three PBR texture maps, color, roughness, and metallic. So these are the maps we have the freedom to texture paint in Procreate. Originally, I tried to bring in the full character head file into Procreate, but Procreate on my sixth generation iPad couldn't support a file of this size currently. So as I work around, I worked on each feature one by one, which I actually enjoyed as there were less layers to worry about and the files were a lot less cluttered. It gave me time to focus on the character of each feature more thoroughly. Let's check out one of these files. The new Lighting Studio workspace is very helpful. I moved a light so I could see my texture better and better imagine the material and the environment of the actual scene. In the base layers, I'll select a map to edit. The metallic map is black, which means there is no metallic interaction. Sometimes it's helpful to view the texture in 2D. Let's drag and drop white onto the metallic base layer to see how this changes the interaction. Now I can clearly see the HDRI in the reflection and the studio lights. Let's revert back to no metallic. Procreate, I think, is currently best for painting the color base layer. Here, I've drawn a simple face on the head, and you can see how easy it is to change the color of the stroke, and how simple it is to draw on the surface of the 3D object. It's very casual and intuitive, and works well. Another important change lies within the brush library in the Material tab. A host of new brushes that are more seamlessly repeatable have been added, I primarily use these brushes for texture painting each feature in the project. Now let's check out the results. Nice! 
but uh, I wanted something with contour lines. Here I used Freestyle, but this wasn't quite cutting it for me. So I decided to bite the bullet and try my hand at Procedural NPR Shader in Blender. Lightning Boy Studio YouTube channel has an NPR Shader introductory series. My shader is based on those first two videos. The first step of this method is to assign each light a single RGB channel. These channels are then controlled in the shader editor with this setup here. With each channel separate, the following color ramps adjust each light source's look as it interacts with the character. For each object, I have either shaded it white with the standard principled BSDF default settings or manipulated each color so that even as the light remains the same, the interactions are different for each shape. As you can see, the base color, shadow color, key light change based on the object. This is what the character looks like in viewport shading. Onto the contour lines. In my collection style, you can see a bunch of grease pencil objects. These were created to apply the line art modifier to the hair strands and water lines of the eyelids, as well as the squiggly eyebrows there. The head outline is created by assigning a black material to the head with back face culling toggled on, then applying a solidify modifier, adjusting the thickness and offset and all that to taste, and toggling on flip normals. With some trial and error and combining outline methods, I came up with a look I was satisfied with. And this is the final thing.